Let's talk about how DoorDash switched from a monolith architecture to a microservices oriented architecture and a lot of the issues that they faced. I think a lot of people, especially beginners, assume that like microservices are like the perfect solution. They're perfectly scalable and they don't come with any side effects, but that's not really the case. Before we get into it, let's first understand why DoorDash would want to switch to microservices in the first place. So to give some context, again, it was in 2020. So at the beginning of the pandemic, you can imagine that DoorDash had a pretty big traffic spike. Just using Google Trends as like a proxy for the traffic, you can see I searched for DoorDash and you can see that they were always growing, but around 2020, they definitely had a pretty big spike. So they had a lot more users. The company itself was probably also growing. This is some approximate data uh, from Statistica, but if we look at like the employee count, clearly it went up. All of these are not necessarily engineers. I would probably think that if they have 20,000 employees, Probably most of them are not engineers, though I could be wrong. But what I'm getting at is that there is a need to scale. So they had a Python monolith and they split it into microservices. First of all, I think it's kind of interesting that they made it this far with Python. A lot of people kind of dismiss Python as like a backend language. And who knows, part of the reason I think that they switched to microservices was so that they could write different services in different languages. For example, Java, whether it's for performance reasons or just for the fact that like Java has static typing, whereas Python doesn't. That's kind of another aspect of scale that doesn't necessarily have to do with adding a bunch of servers, but you know, a code base is more scalable as it grows when it's readable. And I think static typing is a way to make code bases more scalable. But another uh, distinction generally is that microservices are owned by separate teams. With the monolith, every developer was working on it. And they might have separated it like this part of the code is belonging to one team and this part of the code belongs to another team. But generally speaking, it's better for a team to own a microservice because it can be deployed independently, among other reasons. So there are valid reasons to switch to microservices. I think in DoorDash's case, it was very valid, but they ran into some very significant issues. And let's get into them. The first failure is called a cascading failure. And conceptually, it's actually pretty simple. It's no different than like dependent dependencies. If you have a dependency that is failing, then your original code is going to fail. This could be an example of a relatively simple microservices architecture. You have a service which calls two other services and each of those depends on another service, which is the one that is reading and writing from a database. So if at the database layer, for whatever reason, there's higher latency. I think in DoorDash's case, they were doing some database maintenance. And so that increased the latency. From the perspective of service four, this was actually acceptable. Just to keep it simple, let's say the latency here was like one second or something like that. Suppose service three is making a relatively simple request and suppose that the latency here is like another one second and suppose that that's acceptable, like a couple seconds is acceptable, though I'm using like very simplified numbers. Usually you'd want the latency to be smaller than that, especially given that these are services, like these are not clients. Typically in a microservices architecture, you'd want to have instances of your services hosted in the same data center or location. And in that case, like these latency numbers would be very, very small on the order of milliseconds, like 10 milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. And especially given the fact that these services were actually communicating via gRPC, generally a pretty efficient way to make API calls. But now suppose service two is making a more costly request. Suppose that it is like a two second request or something like that. Now, all of this latency from like this part, suppose it's fine, like suppose this side, you know, whatever number we could give it a one or a two or something. Suppose that this latency is acceptable, but from this path, the latency is too high because imagine from the first service, it's the first one that initiated the call. It's waiting. It waited for service two to make the call to service four. It waited for service four to make the call to the database. All that latency is propagated back. And this is a one second a latency as well. And maybe that's the cutoff where the request will time out. API network requests do have a threshold unless you're using like streaming or something. But suppose that this was too much latency and therefore this request didn't just take long, it completely failed outright. That's what a cascading failure is. You have an issue in just one component. It was just the database layer that had the issue and then that was propagated back. And so it's not as if this can't necessarily happen in a monolith architecture, like an increased latency from the database 
could time out requests within a monolith architecture as well. But in this case, I think it is more difficult to debug. You'd need some kind of like tracing tool. At Google, we had like plenty of this because as you can imagine, like Google is all uh, microservices. So there's a lot of good tooling at Google. But imagine from DoorDash's perspective, they're just starting microservices. They're not necessarily experts. And this stuff, I mean, you can read about it on books. You can watch this video right now. You can read a blog post. But until you actually get into it, until you actually start building, you have no idea what's going to go wrong. By the way, I want to quickly mention that a trace tool is basically a tool for like observability. So like kind of the same way you have one um, service making a request to another like you have information about that request you have like the status code how long it took like what was the response to it but imagine you have one request that's making a request and there's like a bunch of other requests involved in that that's what trace means it'll trace that entire request you can imagine a tool like that makes debugging something like this very trivial just because like you would see the latency, you'd see the latency at every single step and you'd see, OK, well, the database layer is the one that's responsible. Imagine that there's 10 different services involved in a single API call. Going to be pretty hard to debug that without a tool like this. Probably the better word to describe it if you want to like Google it, it's called distributed tracing. The second failure type was retry storm. So let's add some context. Imagine you have a healthy system. One service calls another and then there's a response. It's good. Latency is good. There's no error. Maybe once in a while there's a transient error. Maybe for whatever reason the latency was too high. Usually it's latency related, but there might be some like random error. If the request is failing a very small percentage of the time, an easy way to fix that is to implement within the application code some retry logic, right? Just retry the request maybe once or twice or a certain number of times. Very good intentions because most of the time, it will mitigate the issue. But imagine that a service is overloaded. Too many requests are being sent. So this service is going to respond with a failure. It doesn't have the capacity to process the request. So if there's some retry logic built in here now, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to retry. Suppose we code this to retry like three times or five times, whatever. There's a limit to it. It's not going to retry forever, probably. But even with that, so now imagine like there's a hundred queries per second happening here. Let's say the retry logic was like retry five times. This service now is going to, instead of normally like in the healthy system, it would send a hundred queries per second here. But now in the failing system, it's going to keep retrying. It's going to retry five times and all five of those are going to fail. So this is going to be 500 queries per second. So unintentionally, we've taken a service that has too much load and unintentionally, we increased the load by five times. Not good. By doing this, we're pretty much further exacerbating the issue. We're making it worse. Now, there are some ways that DoorDash mitigated this. Try to guess what they are. The first one that came to my mind, honestly, was just like exponential exponential back off. That's kind of like the first layer of defense, I think, against this. But I guess in DoorDash's case, that probably wasn't enough because they actually did not mention this in their blog post at all. They actually had a different solution. Keep watching if you want to know what it was. The third failure type was death spiral. Before even explaining this, I think it's worth just telling you like what the root cause of this is. It's basically auto scaling specifically as it relates to like you might have a specific service and that's what this boundary is and that service has multiple instances right that's kind of the point that's one of the benefits of microservices that you can scale them up relatively easily just add additional nodes and of course to distribute requests to those instances you just use a load balancer nothing crazy and assuming that the load is increasing on the service and we don't have enough nodes there could be some threshold programmed into this based on the utilization the resource utilization of these nodes, probably like CPU, RAM, those are probably the big ones. The usage is too high. Then based on these metrics, the service can be programmed to add additional nodes. Kubernetes is one open source tool that can allow you to do that. But imagine this. Suppose that one of the nodes goes down for whatever reason, not an uncommon thing, right? And so suppose like node one and node two go down. Well, Services like this can also be programmed to replace nodes that fail. Again, Kubernetes is a tool that can do this. So it seems like this would work, right? But one thing you may not be considering is latency, not just request latency, but what's the latency to spin up a server? For example, with AWS like Lambda, that would be considered the cold start. So 
services failed they're being replaced but they're not quite ready yet they need to start there could be a variety of like startup tasks related to just like starting the machine executing a bunch of things opening database connections things like that so they're not quite ready so what's going to happen in this case probably all of the requests are going to go to the remaining nodes now this is obviously a simplified diagram but imagine we just have one node remaining if all of the incoming requests are going to that node a single node where based on the current traffic we actually need three nodes handling the requests what do you think is going to happen to this node well it's going to get overwhelmed and it's going to fail and so this node is going to be replaced and then whatever remaining nodes there actually are right now all the requests are going to be redirected to those and those are going to fail so it's just a continuous negative feedback loop we try to spin up replacements it's a negative feedback loop it's just going to keep going like this Another thing DoorDash mentioned were metastable failures. And so this is a diagram kind of illustrating the state transitions that can cause and fix a metastable failure. What does that mean? Well, it's actually simple. Imagine that a failure is caused by some reason, a traffic spike or a service going down or whatever. And then at some point, that issue is fixed. For example, the traffic spike went back down, but the failure now in the system still exists. Basically, it's like a negative feedback loop that requires manual intervention. And you can imagine that some of the failures that we talked about could cause metastable failures. This is not distinct from the other failures that we talked about. That's what I'm saying. So first, imagine you're in a stable state. Latency is good. The request load is fine. Everything is good. Now imagine that the load on the system, the entire system, by the way, that's what each of these things represents. The load on the system increases. Everything is still fine, but now you're in a vulnerable state. So at this point, you're operating near capacity of the system. And imagine that a sudden user spike happens. Now we go from vulnerable to that metastable state. For example, this could be the result of a retry storm. And so the problem is that once you reach that point, it's self-sustaining. There's not much that you can do. Even once the root cause is mitigated, in this case, the traffic spike, like it goes back down to normal levels, we're still stuck in that state where the system is failing or unhealthy. And the main fix for that would be manual uh, developer intervention. For example, like restarting the servers, manually restarting the servers, figuring out which servers need to be restarted, possibly restarting a database. So whoever's on call is probably not going to have a fun time. Next, I wanted to cover some of the countermeasures that DoorDash took and that they found effective. One was something called load shedding. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. Imagine you have a service that talks to another and it makes different kinds of calls. This is gonna be a pretty oversimplified example, but imagine one of the types of calls is related to payments and perhaps another call is related to fetching images. I don't necessarily know that like the same service would be responsible for these, but again, this is just an example. Imagine that this service is experiencing an increased load. It can't keep up with all of these requests what do you think a solution would be in this case thinking about the user experience payments is pretty important you don't want that to fail and that's kind of the bottom line of a business in DoorDash's case maybe the images of the food that's not a deal breaker the app can technically still function if we're not fetching images so an intelligent decision would be to do something called load shedding this service will say sorry i'm not gonna fulfill these requests right now it's been programmed to do this and how do you think it's gonna do it how do you think it's going to know it should drop certain requests? It should be programmed, obviously, to have some kind of ranking or precedence. Like these are more important than these. Sure. But what is it going to monitor? Probably its own resources. That's the simple way. Like that's the local way to implement this. That gives us a local view of the system. This service is responsible for itself. But there is actually a way to implement this globally, which DoorDash is getting into. But you can read the full article if you want. Uh, details on that but so based on perhaps like cpu utilization something like that it will choose to drop certain requests that's load shedding another countermeasure doordash took was something called circuit breakers it's kind of the inverse of load shedding similar example you can imagine like the payments and images example but from the perspective of this service it's going to say well okay i have two types of requests I'm getting an error from the downstream service. It's returning an error to me. 
So based on that metric, I'm going to stop certain requests, probably the less important ones. And so this is another version of a local countermeasure because notice from the perspective of this service, it's only monitoring what it can see. It's getting errors from the downstream service. So it's going to then make the adjustment. But couldn't you imagine a, perhaps a better solution? I mean, this guy could have more information about the entire system. It might directly know the CPU utilization of the downstream service. Now, this is more difficult to orchestrate because you have a very big system. There's a lot to do, but it's definitely worth exploring. And that's exactly what DoorDash did. But again, we're not going to cover it in this video because it's more complicated. The final countermeasure that DoorDash mentioned was auto scaling. So this is a very obvious solution. As the load increases, just scale up. But the subtle point is that in DoorDash's case, they actually do something called predictive auto scaling rather than reactive auto scaling. Reactive auto scaling is pretty much like the classic uh, AWS Lambda case where like as the load increases, there's going to be more and more instances and it happens automatically. Predictive auto scaling is programming the system such that based on like traffic patterns where um, for DoorDash, it could be pretty predictable. For example, like during the daytime, you can imagine that services like hosted in a country during the daytime are going to probably have high higher load and during the nighttime, it's going to have lower load. That's an example of predictive auto scaling. And the system would have to be kind of programmed to do that. Like, okay, during these hours have these many instances, then during other hours have less instances. The reason that predictive auto scaling could be preferred is that we more or less know that with this, we're going to be safe as long as there isn't like a crazy traffic spike and the traffic patterns are relatively predictable. This is fine. Whereas the reactive version, it would technically still work like during the daytime, it would automatically scale to match the traffic without predicting it. But the downside of that would be what we talked about earlier, where if certain nodes get overwhelmed, they're going to try to be replaced or like auto scaled. And during that period of time, they're going to be overwhelmed and it's going to be like a negative feedback loop, like the death spiral that we kind of talked about. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and leave things there. If you want more details, definitely check out the newsletter or the full blog post. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.